The morning after the night before of the first easing of uh, restrictions for those of us who were, uh, aren't uh, school children going back into school on the 8th of March. But this was 1B yesterday, of course, uh, allowed uh, outdoor sport. Uh, Mum and baby groups allowed uh, a small wedding of six allowed even. We'll talk about that later in the show as well. But I think crucially for most people, it was being allowed to legally meet in your own garden or outdoors uh, with either another five people uh, or two households uh, up to any number. Uh, so uh, that, uh, of course, was uh, a new freedom we all had because thanks ever so much to the government letting us see our own friends and family in our own gardens but we were told by the Prime Minister last night to be cautious at this by the way as this morning we hear that Boris Johnson has joined with the likes of um, Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron and other world leaders uh, to call for a global treaty to deal with pandemics well let's talk about all of this with my first guest of this hour Sir Ian Duncan Smith he's former Conservative Party leader and uh, joins us good morning to you Sir Ian Good morning, Julia. Good morning. morning. I must ask you, first of all, about this uh, uh, world leaders calling for a global treaty to deal with pandemics. Uh, This uh, is uh, published uh, an article in the uh, Telegraph, uh, signed jointly by uh, Boris Johnson, Macron and Angela Merkel. They are joining a total of 24 leaders of the world, including Dr Tedros of the World Health Organization, who's saying that the virus pandemic had been a stark and painful reminder that nobody is safe until everyone is safe. And we need a global settlement uh, similar to what we had in the aftermath of the Second World War to build cross-border cooperation. Operation. Um, there's a certain irony, is there not, uh, for Macron and Merkel, who have led calls in the EU for a vaccine export ban from the EU, now calling for global cooperation to deal with pandemics. What do you make of that? <laughs> it's um, you're you're right. It, it's 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 I think it's 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 a good idea for them to come together to try and work out how these things should work and uh, to make it clear that uh, that they won't descend into. Uh, uh, sort of vaccine nationalism, but uh, the EU has got a long way to go to convince anybody that it really means anything by this at all, because that's exactly where it's been over the last few weeks. I wrote a piece about this the other day, saying that actually they, they've been thrashing around uh, uh, everywhere, but they're still their vaccination rates are very poor. I think it's 15% now across Europe, whereas we're well over 50% and rising. And I think this is all down to planning bad organisation and then blame games and. If that gets rid of that in the future, that's a good thing. But it would be a good idea if they said mea culpa uh, on the way to this letter. Uh, yeah, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? But what's interesting, of course, is uh, it seems to me that if we're going to have a, a global treaty on how to deal with pandemics, for a start, we need to uh, maybe have a global treaty about uh, how we punish those who, who don't do their bit. And, and that would involve the, the Chinese authorities and their failure to tackle what causes these pandemics. And mm-hmm. World Health Organization seems to think that it was a, you know, something happening in a wet market rather than uh, uh, something happening in a Wuhan lab. But either way, Chinese authorities responsible for not sharing their information uh, uh, earlier uh, and uh, not uh, not uh, stopping those wet markets when everyone knows they were a risk. Um, but but also um, we do seem to be when we when we are dealing with the pandemic, the Western world, we seem to be learning rather too much from China than rather too little from our own previous pandemic planning on our own democratic values. We yesterday saw this second stage of the first stage of coming out of uh, of lockdown. So one B uh, ahead of uh, 12th of April, where we see retail and outdoor hospitality be open. Um, but we've still got the Prime Minister refusing to guarantee that we won't go into lockdown again. So our freedoms have been taken away from us for much of the last year with no guarantee that that won't happen again, even when we do get them back. Um, I do worry that we've learned some very poor lessons from China over the last year. Yes, if we go back to the China point, um, I've made this time and again, and countries have been uh, slow to, to, to pick this up. The WHO is in need of major, major surgery because um, at the critical moment it failed. I don't, it's not a blame of theirs, it's the structure. Uh, China knew about human-to-human transfer in December, that is absolutely clear, Uh, quite early on in December too. uh, You saw all those doctors that were writing about this and saying they were all shut down. It refused to say anything about this at all when the WHO asked. And then subsequently through a whole process, They didn't actually officially tell the Chinese that they had an epidemic uh, in China until the 20th of January, by which stage a load of Chinese people had traveled uh, to various places around the world. Uh, Other citizens had come to gone to China and gone away with it. This was a a, a major problem. And the WHO subsequently has done this report, which is about to come out. But we know they arrived in China as a team to investigate this uh, some weeks back. They were then in lockdown for, for nearly 12 days, I think. They then were told they are not going into the laboratories, so they didn't officially ask. 
Uh, they went to hardly any places at all to do the investigation and now produced a report. This report is not an independent investigation. It's what the Chinese have allowed them to do. So all of this, I'm afraid, needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. And finally, of course, I do believe that we, you know, right now, we we learnt the lessons um, about making sure we controlled the nature of the outbreak. But now we've got vaccines. We seem to still be locked into where we are where last year about worrying about another outbreak. The truth is the vaccines themselves, if they're effective, which we now believe they are, uh, then over 50% of the population being vaccinated and the ones at risk means that we can now move at a greater pace uh, to start to get business back and people yeah. back into their um, office. The, the Prime Minister was at least um, giving some cause for hope when he did say yesterday, I, do, I don't see anything in data right now that would cause us to deviate, as in uh, moving the goalposts further away um, uh, in terms of the, the ease of lockdown. But we know that we are moving at a glacial pace compared to last year. And there seems to be now this in the media, this has been set up as somehow as some statement of fact that we came out of lockdown last year, lockdown one, too soon despite the fact they went into lockdown on the 23rd of March and came out on July the 4th when the pubs were allowed to open outside. The idea that this was coming out of lockdown too soon, I, I find frankly laughable given the state of the, the infection rate then and the fact that in July and August and most of September we then did not see any uptick in cases, which does suggest very clearly that we didn't come out too soon. And yet the lessons learned each time seem to always be the wrong ones. Um, and he's saying, he has said also this thing... Uh, well, if the if the vaccine rollout continues to be effective, well, it's already more effective than they could ever have possibly hoped in terms of take up overall. If if the vaccine itself is effective, again, more effective than anyone ever thought, and they never even tested it for stopping infections it's, itself and and transmission of infection, and and it definitely works on that as well. Um, uh, and if people obey the rules, well, people have been obeying the rules as as much as as people can, uh, or, you know, in in terms of uh, you know coping with daily life. Um, we, we we constantly see, though, the goalposts keep being moved to from over 70s being vaccinated to over 50s being vaccinated to now what appears to me to be a, or to all intents and purposes, zero COVID strategy. That's where we are. The Prime Minister said yesterday that he wants to say, he says that we should be doing everything possible to, to protect people. Mm -hmm. That's a zero COVID strategy. Yes, I, 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 I'm a bit puzzled, really. I think most of this comes from the scientists and the medics who are constantly, every time they're asked, to say that, well, they're worried there could be a different variant. And then they're asked, well, is there any evidence that the uh, vaccine won't cope with uh, another variant? And the answer is, well, there's no real evidence of that. Yeah. But they need to be very cautious. Well, we, we do need to be cautious, but it depends what nature caution takes. Uh, the truth is we do have to start getting this economy moving again because, as you've seen, health treatments, uh, people with cancer, heart disease, etc. This has been a major impact, which doesn't seem to be factored in in general terms. And, and also, importantly, people's well-being and health requires them to be able to meet, to be able to do things together. So, so I do believe that we won't be moving off this timetable. I would like, for one, obviously, to see it accelerated somewhat. But... Um, but there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever out there that the vaccines don't work pretty much against all variants. And they've already made plans. Should there be another variant? We have the best testing system in the world now in the biological center, which is able to pick up what those variants do very quickly. And so that will enable them to be able to do other things with the vaccine. So my point is we should now be having confidence that in actual fact, we're going to be all right to unlock, get on with our lives. And we should be doing that as quickly as possible. I reckon. Are you confident that we will not ever lock down again? Because I'm pretty sure there are going to be demands for people to lock down again next autumn. And I'm not convinced that the government will be able to resist those. Well, I think the lockdown itself has done massive damage as much as protect lives in terms of COVID. So what I'm hoping is when we review all of this, we look to get balance in this, particularly as... We've now demonstrated <clears throat> that the capability to produce vaccines is far, far greater uh, than we had anticipated. Yeah. Um, the, you know, we've never produced vaccines at this speed. And this shows you now that we should have less, less worry or fear that we will be unprotected. And I think we know everyone says COVID's not going away. Well, COVID's not going away. Spanish flu hasn't gone away. You know, the one that killed so many people in 1918 still comes back every now and then in the, in the winter. 
uh, but we're now immune to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the real key is viruses don't go away. They, they diminish over time. So we're not saying that we're all fine because the COVID virus is gone. We're saying we're better uh, than we ever would have been because of the vaccines. We should now have some faith in those vaccines. Indeed.